We've been hearing for close to 10 years now about a future Apple self-driving car, but as it turns out, the future is there. <laughs> you join me today here in downtown San Francisco with autonomous vehicle startup Cruise. Founded around the same time that Apple car rumors started surfacing back in 2013, Cruise quickly expanded and was bought by General Motors in 2016. At the end of 2021, they started deploying autonomous self-driving electric cars to the general public. They're accepting applications right now on their website and onboarding nightly. And basically this is a program that allows the general public to use Cruise effectively as an ordinary rideshare between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. And in fact, just as I'm publishing this video, Cruise is now opening up to round the clock operations in San Francisco. But I was given special early access to take a ride during the day with a tour guide, Oliver, Cruise's VP of product. So Oliver, tell me what I'm looking at here. Cause obviously when you have something like a full self-driving Tesla or radar guided cruise control systems, you don't need all of this stuff. Sure. But when you want a, an actual full self-driving car, you're gonna need some tech. Absolutely. So at the very top, you see all of these sensors. You see LiDAR, you see radar, and you see cameras. And really the intent of these sensors is to provide superhuman vision. We've got five cameras facing forward. We've got three LiDAR, or four, five? Lots oh, of LiDARs. Lots of LiDARs. What are these? It's a radar. And what are these? These are both radars. Gotcha. So radars are really useful in very inclement weather conditions. So radar can see through fog, for example. Right. Uh, and what you'll see actually when we're riding is these radars move. So these radars move, they articulate from oh. position to position. So for us, those two extra modalities, LIDARs and radars, enable that sort of superhuman uh, experience. Uh, maybe one day, I'm sure cameras alone will get you there, but mm. not yet. And we're the first right. company in California to deliver this in on the streets of San Francisco. What's fascinating is that all of these technologies combine with a web-based application called WebViz. And this basically works to identify targets, figure out the probability of certain movements and paths, and plot a course for the car to drive through the city autonomously. But it's not just autonomous vehicles running on these powerful web-based applications. There's also today's video sponsor. What if you could be in multiple places at once? Well, now with today's video sponsor Pulseway, you can get all your systems in one central platform. Monitor, automate, or remote into any system from any device closest to you wherever you are. This all-in-one IT monitoring and management platform will be the only tool IT pros will ever need. You can get started with your free trial today and get access to all of Pulseway's features. Check out the link in the description below to learn more. And now let's get back into the video. Now, if you're anything like me, all of this tech talk has got you asking one question. What's in the trunk? Uh, what's in the trunk is a whole bundle of compute. So mm. effectively the brains of our vehicle is locked up in this trunk. And that uh -huh. takes in all of these different sensor readings and then using a variety of machine learning models, makes sense of the world and then plans how the AV is gonna drive through the world and then ultimately controls the car to do so. So is there like literally like a PC with like a Core i7 in there? <laughs> Not quite like a gaming PC if that's what <laughs> you're hinting at. It's, it's um, very much designed to be automotive grade. I think we should go for a ride. Let's do it, it's gonna be fun. Whenever you're ready, press uh, start right here. Oh, here we go. Okay. Let's cruise. I like that. <laughs> All right, door's locked, so we're now trapped in the driverless car. We're not trapped. <laughs> we're very comfortably sat here. I agree. Away we go. And with that, we are on our way. And almost immediately, we encountered our first obstacle, which is this silver Lexus RX that failed to yield completely and blocked the path. And with that big Sienna on the other side, it was a pretty tight spot, so the car had to wait until there was enough room and plan a course to get between the cars. So for reference, I have taken a few cruises at night, I think three or four, but I've never done it during the day. There's never been this much traffic around. <laughs> it's a big difference. It is a big the difference. Full, the result of many, many years of work that we're able to operate fully driverless vehicles uh, in daytime in San Francisco. Yeah, that is pretty crazy. I feel like this is the type of thing that's been the pipe dream, the yep. rumor for so long. Viewers of my channel will know that uh, it's, it's almost a meme at this point 
every couple of months <laughs> for the past 10 years we've heard Apple self-driving car is in development but here we are there's no one there this stuff's gonna creep up on us because absolutely you know it's one of those uh, one of those things like you said that's been talked about so often and then one day you know everyone's just gonna wake up and there's gonna be tons of these things out of their windows moving people moving things uh, I took a while to get here for sure but it's yeah. been worth the wait Going for the ride with Cruz was really, really interesting during the day because all of my previous rides have been at night, which is what most people have access to. Now, the way that Cruz plans these routes for optimal safety is to essentially minimize pulling out into traffic, minimize risky left turns, the maximum speed that the car will go is 25 miles an hour, and this is all designed to keep the car within its limits, operating at maximum safety. But it does beg the question, what are the most challenging intersections or, or, or situations that this car has to commonly be avoiding? Absolutely. I would say it is crowds of pedestrians mm. or just pedestrians as, um, as a, a sort of category. And the reason being is that cars, albeit definitely... This lady is very confused. <laughs> <laughs> she did a double take. We see that all the time. <laughs> pedestrians, how they walk, where they walk, when they walk all of that's relatively unpredictable. So that's been a, um, a key effort in this whole self-driving car to master navigating in and around pedestrians and do so safely. How much of this map, this area of San Francisco that it's able to go in is, is manually input and like trained specifically versus how much is being figured out as you go? So the, the short version is we have a, a cheat sheet and the car um, is able to, to reference that but it always validates it in real time. I mean, I guess the, the, the biggest obstacle for self-driving cars is probably human drivers. I would agree. Because <laughs> you never know what they're gonna do. And a perfect example of that is this Amazon van stopped in the right-hand lane. You can see the car hesitate as it checks if the route is clear, but it changes lanes, goes around the van, and then it goes back to the lane that it was originally in. This was a pretty smooth maneuver. It definitely makes the challenge more complex, right? That you have these unpredictable humans, highly variable drivers on the roads. Um, but the truth is, this is why this technology has taken its time to be developed. Going for a ride in the day, it was definitely clear that there are more obstacles for the car to navigate, which is probably why the map area is smaller. But it did make me wonder, why is Cruz so focused on nighttime transportation? One thing we also really focused on is that nighttime transportation is a particularly um, underserved transportation market and a market yeah. that frankly doesn't have many good options. So for example, you go out to a restaurant with friends, you go to a bar, it's 2 a.m., you wanna get home, you wanna get home safely. Folks really do not like using the ride hail companies today. You get paired with a stranger, right? Right yeah. in your front seat. Uh, who then is literally taking you to your home that knows your home address. Absolutely. So they love the privacy of um, a cruise because it uh, just enables them to, uh, to, to get home safely. We kind of have to get over this aversion to the robots driving me home. And I think the, the key for people is you guys have to basically prove that this is a more reliable and trustworthy and safe experience exactly. than taking an, a traditional ride home. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't just assume because it's a really cool technology that people will instantly flock to it and adopt it, right? right. We have to do the hard work of convincing people um, that this is a better, uh, a better option than, than human-driven cars. And that just takes lots of grind, lots of hard work, mm -hmm. uh, because it's, uh, it's a tall order to be humans. We've been driving for a long time. Oh, look, there's another one. Yeah. Oh, look at that. It's letting us go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rooster. <laughs> this period where you are building trust in the robot. And I think an important part of building that trust is just seeing how it makes decisions. I've seen self-driving cars from the very earliest formative stages um, where they barely work at all, you know, all the way to, to this. And um, even for myself, there was a moment in the very beginning where I had to like, I, like you were, just look at the steering wheel and be like, okay, what decision is it gonna make? How's it gonna do it? And you still build up that trust. So uh, for folks that have never even seen a self-driving car from the outside, right? Which is many, most people in the US, 
there is going to be this period where they have to get used to this and, yeah. and, and gain that trust. Now, in all honesty, our drive that day was pretty much flawless. But what happens if something doesn't go to plan? So I did end up in, in a situation in one of my cruises where there were a bunch of people spilling into the street. Okay. There's a lot of people in the road now. Oh, oh. we're being honked at. That's our first honk. Okay. Oh, and Whoa, then... what are we doing? Oh. Okay, this car is stopped. It needs to go around. Oh no. I got like the chime that said, we're gonna help you get out of this situation. Like the, the remote takeover. Yep. So is somebody remotely driving the car out of there? This is a really important clarification. So. No, no one is remotely driving with a steering wheel or anything like that. The way it works is the remote assistant gives a, a tip or a hint to the car. Okay. And the car's autonomous system then takes that hint uh, to then drive itself. Uh, uh, we don't believe it's safe to have a human remotely uh, actually live controlling driving. the vehicle. Yeah. Exactly. Like you've got latency challenges. Plus, again, we know that we're trying to move away from humans driving cars, right? So exactly. Uh, what we do is provide that tip and then the AV takes that into its planning system and is then able to navigate using that tip. So that's a really fascinating piece of information. Even when the car is stuck, it's still up to the AV itself to get out of that situation, albeit with some hints. And another fun fact, the building in front of which those pedestrians were congregating is the Regency Ballroom, which is where I will be hosting a live in-person event the day after WWDC. So if you do live in San Francisco, come hang out with us at the Regency Ballroom. I'll have that linked down below. It's going to be a lot of fun. So what happens if I reach around here and try to grab the wheel or take control of the car? So we've definitely thought about this and what would happen is you would not be able to exert any force on the wheel uh, or the pedals. Uh, the, uh, the steering wheel is fully in control, the car is fully in control and you wouldn't be able to, to steer the car, for example. Gas pedal doesn't work. Gas pedal doesn't work. Uh, the, the car is controlling that uh, through some, uh, through some uh, other means uh, in the car. I mean, I guess it makes sense. Most modern cars, the, the, the gas pedal isn't actually doing anything it's just a switch exactly uh the the sort of drive-by wire all right well it looks like we are arriving back at our destination you know we didn't have any hard braking moments or any real like evasive maneuver moments really smooth i thought i guess that's that's the benefit of why you would want to roll something out slowly by doing you know 25 mile an hour it gradual get people used to it before it's you know going on highways. It's a brand new experience and we want folks to enjoy it. We want to deliver the best possible experience. So the adoption of this technology is really, really high. And uh, I think we're, we're on our way to doing that. We should see a prompt here. Okay. Great riding with you. Great riding with you. Thank you for the walkthrough. Do we, do I have to hit end right here? Uh, no. we're, we're good. We can you just can, get out? We can step out. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Dazzle. Parking brake released, and off it goes. Bye, Dazzle. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed. I'm really, really curious to see where this technology goes. We're finally at a point where any one of us can just go get in a driverless car, and I think that's pretty incredible. Let's see where this takes us. But in the meantime, I've got a longer extended edit of the interview with Oliver available over on my car channel. And I also have a 30 plus minute unedited nighttime drive where you can watch from start to finish an entire ride with Cruise. So definitely go ahead and check those out linked in the description below. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.